All right, so uh, we're going to be doing this worksheet, Solving Sexual Assault and Paternity Cases with RFLP, and then uh, it's going to be us going to help you with our uh, formative for this week, where you're going to have to be able to interpret um, an auto rat for RFLP and determine the genotypes and paternity of it using just an auto rat. So the directions here is to use the auto rat provided to answer the following questions about paternity. So one thing, key thing to point out is that how you solve a paternity case is going to be different than how you solve a rape case. So with paternity cases, offspring is going to share 50% of their DNA with mom and the other 50% with dad. You're not looking for a 100% match. So you're looking for a 50% match, whereas with a sexual assault case, you're going to look for a 100% match. Because with paternity, you only give half of your DNA to your offspring. So whatever half that they didn't get had to come from the other partner. And then with uh, sexual assault, that all of that DNA had to have came from the uh, from from the um either the victim or from the perpetrator so the perpetrator cannot have dna that does not match the rest of his cells so every single cell in your body has identical matching autosomal dna it's only whenever you look at the sperm cells the haploid cells that they're going to have um combination but still all of that dna belongs to this man so for paternity we're looking for a 50 50 percent match so let's go ahead and get started. So for number one, let's go ahead and get my little typing tool out so we can get started. Uh, we want to uh, look at the results for a single locus probe DNA fingerprint analysis for a man and a woman and their four kids. So you look at here, we have six different people. So in lane one is child one, lane two is child two, lane three is our mother, lane four is our father, lane three is child three, and then Last but not least, lane four is going to be child four. And then we have up to four different genotypes here. So the genotypes we just labeled arbitrarily with A, B, C, and D. A being the shortest fragments up to the top, because if you recall from our RFLP simulation, smaller bands are found at the top. And then the largest bands are going to be... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, the largest bands will be found at the top since they're slower moving because they're so large that it, it's going to be have a hard time going through the gel, whereas your smallest bands will be at the bottom because they run fastest. So we have four different sizes bands. And since this is a single locus probe, we're going to be looking at variable number tandem repeats, VNTRs, that are that are at a single locus. What that means is that of all the different VNTR locations within the genome, we're only looking at one location and there's only two possibility of band sizes. So if you have two different band sizes, you are heterozygous. And if you have one band size, you're homozygous. That means if we are homozygous, both parents have the same size um, bands, uh, um, pass down the same size bands to that child. Whereas if you have two different size bands, one parent, gave you the larger one, so uh, right here is the larger one, another parent gave you the smaller one. So uh, for question number one, you want to explain how can you determine if a child is related to the parent. So you want to compare, let's change the size of this font because this is way too big, band sizes of the child to the parents both bands, so one band should come from the mom and the other band should come from the dad. There should not be ba any bands that are not shared by either parents. And the reason being is that all of your genes either come from mom or dad. So they are passed down by random assortment. So you either get one, uh, one of the two, 50-50% chance of, uh, I don't know, so mom has A and D, that 50% A, 50% D. And mom can't give you anything else but A and D. And if it came from this dad, dad has 50% 50, 50 chance of giving you B and a 50% chance of giving you C. And both uh, of your bands should either come from mom or dad. So we'd have to look at the DNA and see that each kid has one from mom and one from dad. So our question number two is to figure out by looking at the cell, which child is least likely to be the biological offspring of this couple? So what you want to do, I'm going to use my highlight tool, 
is that I want to go across and see which ones belong to mom and which one belongs to dad. So the easiest way to do it is just to see mom. And mom has the A size band. So I'm going to highlight the A row right here. So any band shared uh, shared with child and mom that shows that that could be the gene that the mom gave. And right here, D, we have moms. Once again, she gave she potentially gave all of these D genes or alleles to the kids. So then I'm going to change the color. Let's be heteronormative and go with blue. That the father had to either give a B band or the C band right here. So what you want to do is just go across and see, do, do each of the kids have a band, each from mom and from dad. So child number one, it looks like child number one, right here, we have, oops, we have this band right here, C, which matches with the dad, as well as D, which matches with mom. So number one definitely is the child of this mom and dad. So let's look at number two. Number two, we have a band A, which matches with mom, but then we also have a band, uh, the second band is band D, also matches with dad. So here's an issue. None of the bands matches dad. So unless this is an exact clone of mom, mom just self-replicated, child two cannot exist. The other option is that she made it with someone who shares the same bands as her. So maybe um, another father could have given A and then she could have given D, or maybe the father could have given D, and then um, the child could have gotten um a from mom. So two cannot be from the father because father can only give B or C. So I'm going to go ahead and circle it. But we want to check to make sure that the other kids also share bands with both parents so that we're completely correct. So let's look at child three now. So child three, uh, we have a B band as well as D band. So the B band belongs to the father. And the D band also belongs to mother. So child three is a biological offspring. And last but not least, we have child four. We have an A band, which matches with mom, and then a B band, which matches with dad. So three and four are also the kids. So that rules out one, three, and four. Therefore, number two who does not have any bands in common with the dad in our fourth column is likely not the biological offspring of both parents. So explain your choice in question two using inheritance theory. So child two has the A and D allele. So the genotype, you say AD. Yeah, let's just say genotype. Child two has the genotype AD and shares both bands in common with mom. But let's delete that. And none in common with dad. And if child two was the offspring of dad, they must they must inherit either the B or C allele. So because of the fact that they don't have B or C, it cannot be the child of this father. So I'll go ahead and write that down. You can pause the video if you need more time. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the second gel. So the second gel right here, we have, once again, A, B, C, and D. And then these uh, five columns here now represent samples from four kids and their fathers. So now we have the tricky part, trying to figure out who's the dad. So we didn't even tell you which one is the dad. So what you want to do is just look through all of the gels, uh, look through all of the uh, profiles and see which one has something in common with every kid? Because your dad has to give 50% of the DNA for all of the bands. So um, what we're going to look at and see who has something in common with every single one. So siblings will automatically share about one half of your DNA with um, one half their DNA with the with each other and one half with the parents. But the parent is going to share with every single kid, whereas each kid does not have to share it with um, each other. So looking at here, we have 
the genotype. Let's let's just type it out. So for number one, we have the genotype of uh, person one, the genotype of A and C, and then person two has the genotype of C and B. So we could see here that these two kids carry C in common, so one parent has C. We don't know if it's mom or dad yet. And then person three, look at me being inconsistent with my formatting, person three has the genotype of B and, uh, B and C. So person three has something in common with, uh, only C in common with both person one and two, but B's not in common with either of them. And then we have person four, and then person four is going to have B and D. And last but not least, we have person five it has A and B. So what you want to see is which bands are in, uh, which profile has something in common with everyone. So, so each kid, so if person one was the dad, let's just draw a phylogeny chart if you want to. Hmm. <laughs> no. All right. So if person one was the dad, the kids should either have an A and a C from each, uh, each, each kid. Two, three, four, and five should have either A or C. So if they don't have either A or C, that person one cannot be the parent. So let's see. So person two has C. So we could go ahead and pass on to uh, go over uh, to person three. Person three has C as well, but uh, B. So it's possible that the B came from the mom. And then person four, though, does not share any bands in common with person one. Person one has A and C, person four is B and D. So there is no way person four could have descended from person uh, one. So I'm gonna go ahead and cross that out. Person one probably is not our father. And then last but not least, look at person five. Person five does have A in common with person one. So let's see, maybe person two is a dad. So everyone should have either a C or a D. So person one does have a C. So that's possible right now. Person three has a C as well. That's possible. And then four, person um, four has a D in common with person two. So that's possible. But then once again, person two is C, D. Person five is A, B. Once again, we do not share any bands in common. So person five, to be the offspring of person two, has to either have a C or a D, and they have neither. So I'm going to go ahead and cross out person two. So let's look at person three now. Person three has B and C. That stipulates that everyone should either have a B or a C to be uh, their offspring. So person one has a C, so we're good here. Person two has a C, so we're also good here. Person four has a B in common person three, and person five has a B in common too. So we can actually put a check mark here and say person three can potentially be our father. Then uh, person four now has a B and D. So B, person four is the dad. Each kid should either have a B or a D. So person one, no B or D. So we can already cross it out. We've got A, C, B, D. Can't, can't work. Go ahead and cross it out. And then you can compare the rest. They have D in common with uh, person two, B in common with three, and B in common with person five. But because of the fact that we clash with number one, four can't be the parent either. And last but not least, person five, A and B, each kid should either have A or B. Uh, so number one, A is there. Number two, C and D doesn't match. So because C and D cannot come from A and B, we're gonna go ahead and cross out five. So that leaves us with the answer of person three. So person three is our father. So let's go ahead and type it up. So explain how you determine the choice below using inheritance. Person three must be the father because a parent gives because each of his kids inherits one of two alleles from the dad. Person three has the genotype B, C, 
each offspring has either so each offspring or person one two four and five share either have a b and c allele so for example person one person one inherited looks like c person two inherited c as well person four inherited b and person five inherited b so therefore this is the possible parent and then the other combinations could not have worked all right so as we mentioned earlier that whenever you're looking at a rape investigation or blood at a crime scene so you're comparing a known and an unknown rather than paternity that it has to be a hundred percent match so it has to be the exact same profile so um looking at this sample so before we begin we're going to look at our dna auto rad so looking at each of the columns uh, the information is as follows the first column is the known blood of the victim so whoever the rape victim is uh, she has these two bands right here and then number two is dna from the defendant so the alleged perpetrator we don't know if they actually are guilty yet but that's his dna right here these two bands and then uh the third column is the dna size marker the dna size marker is kind of like a ruler for dna and the person who loads um the size marker knows exactly the size of each of the bands based on how bolded they are so for example we know that maybe this first bolded section right here is exactly 500 base pairs and this other second uh bolded one is going to be a thousand uh kilobase pairs that we can know precisely uh, and use numbers qu quantitative data to present in court uh, to uh, share your information. It makes it a little more precise. Uh, we have column number four right here, the female fraction. So from the vaginal swab of the swab of the victim, so after um, a rape, during a rape investigation, go to the hospital, they take a rape kit and then they swab the vagina and then look for DNA not belonging to the victim. So the female fraction should belong to the victim. And then we have these two bands here. And last but not least, we have the male fraction right here, these two bands. So we wanna see if based on our results, comparing the DNA of the male fraction here to the defendant, if these bands belong to the the male. So question number one is to explain why semen found on a victim belonging to the suspect must be 100% matched to a DNA sample obtained directly from a suspect. Is it possible for semen to have different DNA from cheek cells, blood cells? So when we collect DNA from our perpetrators, we tend to do a cheek swab or you can get a blood sample as well. So but remember, you need to have probable cause that a sus uh the sperm found at the crime scene m must have dna that is an exact match with the perpetrator so dna left behind by a perpetrator can only come from that individual cannot have non-matching DNA. So if there's any bands that do not match what the defendant has, it cannot be a match. So at this point, what you want to do is just look at the band. So even if some are shared, there's a lot of people share DNA, that unless it's a 100% match, we cannot say it came from this person. So let's go ahead and move on to question number two. Maybe I have to add that picture. Hmm, I think I have to add the picture. Let's uh, do a little intermission right here. This is like real class news. Snip, snip, snip. Copy right here. And I'm going to paste it towards the right, right here. No, maybe the left. Then the left right here. So for number two. If a comprehensive multiple loci probe reveals matches at all but one locus of the DNA from the male fraction semen does not match the suspect, can it possibly come from the suspect? Why, or why not? No. The, so this answer is no. And the reason being is all DNA found at the crime scene must be a 100% match to the perpetrator. 
the DNA results would exclude our defendant. Although the male DNA shares one band in common, so it's about a 50% match, that the second band or second allele does not belong to him. So if he did not give that allele, who did? You think that the, uh, the woman did? So we look at this one right here, and it doesn't look like the woman gave it. So someone get, put that DNA in her, and it didn't belong to didn't belong to the defendant or the victim. So at this point, we're going to be starting to look at other people, and then it's not going to be our defendant here. So for number three, we're going to compare the DNA sample from the defendant, lane two, with the crime scene evidence. Lane four and five, should the suspect be included or excluded? So based on our analysis, our suspect should be excluded because the topmost band in column five, male frat fraction or fraction does not belong to either victim or defendant. This means this allele was contributed by someone else and we want to look at other suspects we, uh, that will have an exact match. So the reason being is, once again, whenever you are looking at crime scene data versus uh, data from your unknown suspects, that it has to be a 100% match. So when you bleed, all that DNA that is in the blood is going to be 100% identical to the blood that is found in your body, within your cheek cells, within the blood cells, within your body. And you cannot make um, genotypes that does not match what you already have. You cannot contribute genes you do not have. So that means the male fraction right here, because it's not 100% match to our defendant, cannot be from this guy. We need to start looking somewhere else.